as we read God's Word. Pastor is preaching this morning from a couple of different passages, Luke 18 and 1 John 5, and we have these printed for us up here on the screen today. I'm going to have us go ahead and read these together, so uh, let's make sure we wait for one another with the waiting for all the punctuation and all that kind of stuff, and let's read. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Greg, could I ask you to pray for our scripture this morning? Amen. Go ahead and have a seat if you would. In the early parts of the uh, 1900s, 1920s, 30s in that neighborhood, there was a pastor by the name of Leon Hill, and um, he like to tell jokes and funny stories. In fact, in a little book that he wrote entitled, Oh, for the Life of a Preacher, he said in the, in the forward to that, he said that he had been a, a Baptist pastor most of his conscious life, whatever that means. But in that book, he related the story of a, uh, of a, a meeting that was being held, a, a revival meeting that was being held in this particular town. And they had invited a young man who had just recently graduated from seminary to come and have the opening prayer. And so this man, uh, this young man got up and he prayed. And as uh, Pastor Hill wrote, he prayed as only high, uh, high academics can pray. In other words, this was a very, very well worded, very uh, poetic, just this really nice, nice sounding prayer. And the pastor who was to give the message got up after that and said, young man, three prayers like that would freeze hell over. The, the point of that was that we can go through all the motions, but if it's just going through the motions, if it's just up here, if it's just coming out of our mouth and that's it, it really doesn't do much for the Lord. Uh, God is interested in what is in our hearts. And um, a number of years ago, uh, one of the contemporary song uh, writers, Matt Redman, he was leading uh, song services in their church in England. And after that service was over, the pastor said, guess what? You guys are going on hiatus for the next six months. That was horrible. Your hearts are no longer in this. Figure out what the problem is and fix it. And so as a result of that, basically having to take a break from worship, they wrote this song, The Heart of Worship, and it just talks about that. You know, take all the trappings away. What is my heart saying? Because that's what God is interested in. God doesn't care what the outside looks like. He doesn't care what we wear. He doesn't care about anything except our heart and our heart's relationship with Him. And so let's sing this morning, The Heart of Worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, 
and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all thank you that we are here for you because Lord if we were here for ourselves it would just devolve into a bunch of everyone wanting to have their own way and Lord when we're here for one purpose and one one person it just makes life a whole lot easier so Father this morning as we continue in this time of worship of praise of Bible study Lord as pastor comes and brings that message you've laid upon his heart Father, we pray that you would take that word, that you would break the stony places in our heart. Father, that you would find fertile ground. And Lord, that your word can take root and accomplish your purposes in each life. And Lord, we'll praise you for it. For it's in your sense name we pray, Lord. Amen. If I were to ask you this morning, what is the most valuable thing that you possess? Within a setting such as this in public, we would get different answers than if we were to talk one-on-one -on -one, or if you would consider in your own heart at home, what's the most valuable thing that you possess? And then it's a whole different answer if you were to take a survey of the time that you spend with people and or things. What am I saying? If I were to say, what's the most valuable thing to you? The right answer would be the Lord. Yes, good answer. Sir. Others would say, my wife. Without my wife, I'm nothing. Yes, good answer. My husband, my children, everything I've done and everything I do is for my children. They're the most precious to me. Now, if you were to think to yourself, what are the most precious things? Uh, you may sometime realize, well, 
my 401k is not doing too good. <laughs> my whole life rests upon the 401k, and it's a roller coaster ride. Some of us would say, well, crypto, what a skydive that has become. I don't think it's gone yet, but boy, it's way down there. Some would say it's a great time to buy, right? Because it's so low. What are some of those valuable things? And, and today's society is saying the world is running back to gold. Some of you have gold. I don't know. All I've got is that song. Uh, here on earth, I don't need gold or silver, uh, just the Lord. Uh, some of you have coins of gold and silver, and you're trying to put some of your, I won't say wealth, but some of your belongings into something that seemed to last longer than what the world economy is doing to what we hold to be valuable. What's the most precious thing? that you hold. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, there's this discovery. We have this word that we talk about often called faith. And I would like these couple of months, July, uh, July and August, that we would walk together and drive deep into the overcoming power the victory, the practical application of faith in your life as a believer in God, in Jesus. It's got to be much more than what the world says, even in the health system settings in the hospital, whether you're a Muslim, a Hindu, or a Christian, they say it's good to have faith because it does good to your body. I would say that without Jesus, uh, that is just good thinking or good, having great wishes with no effect. Just have faith doesn't work. So, uh, first Peter chapter 1 verse 7. Peter says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, not just any faith, not just fool's gold. We're talking about Bogus Mountain. Uh, when you first get here, you wonder, why is it called Bogus? Great skier, yeah, not much for gold, right? They came here back in the day hoping there was gold with all the uh, tools and desires and dreams, and they found nothing but fool's gold, and therefore they call it Bogus Mountain. And people find that out many times about their own faith or religion. And they come to a point where they say, well, where is God? Because they find out that their faith has no value. How come things are falling apart? Haven't I done the right things? Peter says, this testing of the genuineness of your faith. So as we begin to drive deep, you know that song back in the day by Boney M, I've been searching for a heart of gold. How many of you still remember that song? Yeah, great song, right? You're looking for someone, not just good looking, but someone that has a heart of gold. Someone that knows love and sacrifice and worthiness. In this case, God is looking and he says, the faith that you have in your heart, he values it. This faith that's genuine, more precious than gold. Now this gold that perishes as it is tested by fire. This faith may be found to result. This, this faith that God has given you, it's supernatural. It will result in praise, glory, and honor. When? When the Lord Jesus shows up. What is this faith? We talk about it. We read, even in Hebrews chapter 11, we know that that's the, that's the, the hallway of faith or, 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 or the museum of faith, some would call it. And you read about Abraham and about Isaac, about Jacob and Samson and Gideon, and you go, ooh, ah, isn't that great? People that were cut in two and they lost their heads because their faith they had in God. Some of us walk through that hallway of faith like we used to walk through art museum when we were kids when we were 
taken to the art museum by uh, a school field trip or parents. I always liked the, the space and air museum. What are these paintings? You walk down the hallway, mm, nice. Mm, what's the name? Rembrandt. Okay, we'll move on. And, and we would like some of the abstract or some of the, the landscapes. And, and, and we just walk by, meant nothing except, okay, nice. That's how sometimes we react to this word faith. And it's, it's different levels of faith that we deal with in life. Have you ever realized as you pray, let's say Paul comes to me and say, uh, Lorian, pray for me. All these things are falling apart. And, and I would say, yes, I'm going to pray for you. And, and I say, Lord, in your great knowledge and wisdom, all those prayers he mentions earlier. And I, I, I'm, I'm just proclaiming all God's greatness over his life. And I got faith for you. Because it's not touching me. But when I find out that my son is sick, or my wife is losing her job, or that I am sick, what does that faith look like at that point? We traffic in faith to help others. But now the testing of the fire to find out the real faith that we have when we ourselves are touched and broken and falling apart. What do you do then? Turn with me to Luke 18, Luke 18, verse 7 and 8. Because we just read in 1 Peter about the revelation of Jesus Christ, the faith that you have. God has looked throughout centuries and millennia, and, and he was looking for faith. He looked at Abraham, and Abraham said, I, I love my son. What do you mean my only son? Okay, Lord, I'll take him up the mountain. And the moment he raised the knife to take his son's life for God's glory, which God would have never allowed, that faith God counted as righteousness, salvation, Placing his faith in God's promise, in who God is, God's presence, God's protection, God's love. All this to the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. What's this revelation of Jesus? Look at Luke chapter 18. And will not God give justice to his elect? Uh, think of today's time in the church praying for God's justice. Roe versus Wade was turned back to the states as per constitution. And the rest of the government says, bah humbug. We don't like that law. We're going to do whatever we want. Where's justice? Right? Just an example. Who cried to him day and night, God, where are you? Jesus says, will he delay long over them? Will he wait as they cry and they ask for God's interference? Finally, no more lies. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. However, I think that word speedily has to do with the eternal perspective. <laughs> so in God's timing, it's quick. In ours... A day is like a thousand years, right? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? What is that talking about? When Jesus returns, one, to take away his church, when Jesus returns the second time to judge the world, he's asking the question, He's talking from a third perspective, but he's talking about himself. Will he find faith in the world? What does that mean? To understand that, you've got to remember that Jesus said that the last days would be like the days of Noah. When they were eating and drinking, marrying and working, and no one cared, and Noah was preaching the end is coming, and they were laughing at him. There was no faith. Will there be faith when the Lord comes back again? And obviously would say that while the, while the church will be raptured, there will be no faith. There will be antichrist and judgments. 
lack of faith. The question is right now for the church. For judgment must begin at the house of God in its purification and preparation for the coming of the Lord. Is there faith? And we would ask that question, are you a faithful person? And is this church, if the Lord was to write a letter to the church of Trinity in Boise, what would he say to us as he wrote to Ephesus and Philadelphia and or Laodicea? What would he say to us as a church? Do we live by faith? Do you know what that is? Now, to put in a practical sense, and some of you that are not golfers may not understand this illustration, but I've told someone that there are no better illustrations of spiritual walk with the Lord except when you go golfing. And the idea is this, there's no other sport that takes things down to a basis level of who you are, your discipline, and or plus your faith as in golf. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. If you're playing soccer, it's a fluid sport. You kick the ball, you run, you pass, you kick and you hope you score. If you're playing football, you block, you run, you try to throw, you catch. It's always ongoing. There's no time to think. There's lots of time to think when you play golf. All sorts of emotions when you play golf. To try to explain to you the idea in the pinpoint of faith, think about this. One of the first, the first things you do when you play golf is you've got to hit the ball. In my case, it's so much more than the discipline, the skill set. There's so many things happening when you play golf. The body posture, the hand grip, the way that you turn, the way that you spring, the way you come back down, the way that you pendulum. There's a thousand things playing into one perspective to hit that little ball. So it goes a long way. Now, unlike tennis or ping pong, which is, again, fluid and fast. With golf, that ball has to be hit just the right way at exactly the right time, and you've got to be so focused, otherwise it's not going to work. It takes concentration, takes discipline, takes patience. And so last week, Dan and I went golfing, and for the first time in my life, we were paired up with two other guys, wonderful guys. One was a believer. The other guy was so fun, and he was a good golfer. But on their golf cart, they had attached a boom box. And as I'm getting ready to address the ball, and I'm focusing, here they pull up in a golf cart, and they got music jamming like you would not believe, loud. I thought I was transported to a beer garden somewhere in a bar somewhere. The music was so loud, and I'm looking at the ball, and I'm thinking, I can hit this. Because here's what I need before I hit the ball. As I look at the ball, I imagine in my mind that I'm going to hit it just right. I imagine in my mind how I'm going to hit it. I'm doing nothing but I look only at the ball. No birds, no Bambi, nobody talk, no Bucks Bunny, definitely no boombox. I want to hit that ball just right. Basically, I have faith that I'm going to hit that ball and hit it well. And I grab on to that faith and that belief. And only then, you've seen people go up to golf and they get ready and then somebody makes noise in the crowd and they walk away, right? And they come back and they reposition. It's that concentration, that point in time when you reach the unseen and you have that kind of faith that I'm going to make a move and I'm going to believe this is just a game. But that has so much to do with your spiritual life. Jesus says that you've got to have faith like a, like a mustard seed. James says, listen, when you pray for wisdom, you must have faith. What is this faith? So, this was the introduction to the introduction. The idea is this. I want to draw you in that these ne next eight weeks... We will look at what God has given us 
in this thing that's more precious than gold, this faith we've been given that we place in Jesus and what it looks like and how it stays there and, and how do you use it and how do we use faith when we deal with sin, habitual sin in our lives? Can this faith overcome that sin? How do you deal with faith when it deals with depression? How many of you here deal with depression on a regular basis? How many of you deal with loneliness? How does God use that faith? Can you find an answer in Scripture in dealing with loneliness? What do you do with anxiety and fear? Does faith have a place in that? Scripture says, yes, and much more so, for we are more than conquerors. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. John says, For everyone who has been born of God, if you are born again, if you've given your heart to the Lord Jesus, surrendering to Him and repenting for your sin, you've been given new life. You're a new person in Christ. That's what this means. Everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. Christians are not paupers. Christians are not ones that keep going to one group to another saying, I am a sinner and I can't get away from it. You are overcomers more than victorious. It's not the program that fails. It's me that fails, but God never fails. And there's something missing in my connection, dedication, repentance, and understanding what it means to walk by faith. That's the missing link. It's not that God is not powerful enough to set you free. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. Doesn't just dabble and spar and hope to get away. You overcome it. And if this is, and this is the victory, what's the victory? How do I overcome the world? This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Will Jesus find faith when he comes back? As we know that we are in the last hours, last minutes of the Lord's return for the church, we must look at our hearts and the genuineness of our faith. Verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We're being given a, a, a foundation, the basis as we move on of building and diving deep to really understand and grasp. This faith will transform the way you live. It's one thing to say, I'm going on vacation. I'm going on vacation in two days. Yay! And the morning of my bags are not made yet. Well, are you really going on vacation or not? But yeah, how come you're not preparing? And we ask the same question, is the Lord coming back? Yes, He is. How come we're not doing what must be done before He returns? Like telling people that you love and your neighbors about the Lord Jesus and the true salvation in the Scriptures? Oh, what do we believe about His return? This, this world that we are to overcome, look at 1 John chapter 2.15. This thing that John refers to are the things that the world has that wants to separate us from God. So this faith deals with a point of salvation, but then it deals with our lifetime of struggle and battle and victory over the things that the world throws at you from within and from without. Do not love the world, 1 John 2.15. Don't love the world or the things that are in the world. I hear that verse whenever I browse some of the YouTube videos and there is a red Ferrari. Oh, never driven one. I know I'll never own one. Once I think, wow. If I, I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We're going from admiration to desire, and that can drive deep. You know that place. You know that thing that draws you, that tells you spend your time, your money, and run and get it. That thing. Don't love the world or the things that are in the world, he says. Because if, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not within you. The two are not compatible. You cannot live both and claim both and live a different way. You either love God and you hate the world world that's in the world, not the people. 
and love God or you love the world and hate God. And then John says, here's why. Here's why you can't, can't have two masters. As the Lord said, ma'am and money and God, you can't serve the two. Check where your heart is, where you spend your time, your most precious thing for all that is in the world. Three things, which were actually the temptation that Adam and Eve received. Three things, the desires of the flesh, which is immorality, the inordinate emotions, the thing that we want to fall in love with, our lust, uh, our, our um, I would say that sometimes we struggle against loneliness by grabbing the desires of the flesh. The desires of the eyes, which is materialism, greed, covetousness, and the pride of life, which is arrogance, vainglory, boasting. These three things, the flesh, the eyes, and the life, they're not from the Father, but from the world. And the world, he says, listen, is passing away along with all its desires. If you are caught holding on to them, you'll pass away with the world. But whoever does the will of God abides, remains forever. These three things can be summarized in one word. What is it? Sin. Sin. And Satan knows exactly how to attack you. He knows your tendencies. He knows the way you have been shaped. He knows what attracts you. He knows what turns your head. He knows what deepens your mind and thought. And he throws at him at you in different nuances, different connections. He tries different formulations constantly. But God says this faith in the Lord Jesus, this faith will overcome the world. These are the things in the world that can hinder your relationship with God. This is beyond the step of being set free in Christ. Once you belong to Him, now you've got the strength. Here's what you've got to battle. And here's what we want to attack this summer. Faith that can overcome anxiety. Faith that can overcome disappointment. Faith that can overcome depression, fear, grief, despair, and loneliness. Now, this could be emotional states of mind. You don't talk about them. You don't share them often because it's embarrassing. And that's why at times the enemy has got you in a corner like a bully and he's punching you away. How are you? I'm doing fine. <laughs> I'm doing okay. And you're trying to survive and you wonder where is help against these attacks? Where these emotional states of mind that are not caused by an organic condition, true physical illness, these are often results of sin. When we choose a different way to cope with the situation other than the Father, the Lord Jesus, in His Word. For whatever is in the world that might hinder our relationship with God, there can be victory in overcoming the world. And this victory is only in Jesus and the Word. So, I'm going to leave you with the first foundational basis of faith. So we can go home searching our hearts to see if we are at that point. We want to look at the, at, the, at the basis of faith, and then we want to look at the building up of faith. What is faith, aside from the definitions that we know and we recite, like good children in school, but when you're driving and the accident occurs, what do you do? Where is faith in that situation? So we'll look at the basis of faith right now. Next week, we'll take a look at the foundation or the, the building up of that faith. How do I get faith? It's not just by talking or saying or declaring. When you have faith as a test, there's a sense of peace, a sense of certainty. 
a conviction that settles your heart. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, listen, no matter how many times you're going to fire up that oven, that furnace, we will not bow. And we're okay with it. They had such peace. This kind of faith gives you the peace and the certainty. And you have no idea how it's going to happen, but you can even smile at it saying, Oh Lord, I can't wait to see what you're going to do because I know you're here. The basis of faith. And we'll explain this like we would to children. Because that's what the Lord Jesus wants from you and me, to be like children. First of all, at the heart of faith, there's simplicity and trust. It's not complicated. Some people say, don't overthink it. The simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the word, the Holy Spirit that translates that word from truth to even the peace and the emotions of calming. That's the one thing the angels and the Lord Jesus always said, do not fear. Calm down. You believe in the Father, believe also in me. Simplicity and trust. And this is to be understood that our faith has to be like a child. We've heard this before. Childlike faith. Mark was 10 years old. Brandon was 7. I forget what the situation and the instance was, but I was talking to Mark because he asked a question about his soul and eternity and Jesus, and he's heard it, but now he's really beginning to grasp some of the consequences and the eternality of life. And, and I began to talk to Mark in the kitchen table back in Rolling Meadows, and Brandon was there too, seven years old. And I'm talking to Mark about Jesus and receiving him and surrendering and repenting. And Mark said, I want to do this. That. Now, when that happens, when I hear that so quickly, I, I do like what the Lord Jesus did to the rich young ruler. Are you sure you know what you want to do? Here's what it really means. Yes, I want to do that. Well, let me tell you some more of what it really means to, to sacrifice your life and, and to surrender it all. And I went through the whole thing, and Mark said, yes, I want Jesus in my heart. All this time, Brandon sits there, and he's just listening, not saying a word. And then, after Mark and I finished praying, Brandon says, I want that too. Now, my adult mind thinks seven years old, I don't know how long it's going to last, and do you really understand? So I went through the whole thing with Brandon. And so simple, so easy. He said, I want this Jesus in my heart. Childlike faith, it's what Jesus wants. Not that, it doesn't mean that you are uh, limited in your understanding. It means there is a trust that goes beyond comprehension because you choose to say some things I don't understand, but I understand who you are. It's not philosophy. It's not the weight of the knowledge. It's the who you are. Turn to Matthew nineteen fourteen. You see, this childlike faith in the simplicity and trust of this faith. Faith is just a general persuasion of the mind that a certain statement is true. And that's the scholarly definition. Faith is a general persuasion of the mind that a certain statement is true. It begins here. It's got a little bit to go to it gets to hear. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That transition from the, heart, from the mind to your heart. And that's where it becomes conviction. Matthew 19, 14. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such other translations, to such as these belong the kingdom of heaven. So I ask myself, do I have that childlike faith? Now all I can do is translate that to my first skydive. I walked up to the instructor, 
And um, first question was, how many jumps do you have? He said 10,000. I'm like, Whew. he's been doing it quite a while. And I was still a bit nervous, though I wasn't showing it. And he said one thing, which is actually quite humanistic. But to me, I grabbed onto it that day. He goes, I have dinner plans. Don't worry. So I put my faith and trust into this guy that was about to control the parachute and the timing and all the, all the problems that could happen. He promised me by his confidence that we would be okay. And I jumped out of the, first, out of the plane the first time. Liked it so much, went right back the same day. And then I began to put my trust ultimately in God's hand, my main parachute, and the reserve Ultimately, God, because I've had a number of malfunctions, whole different stories, different ones, but God always had me in his hand. But because I believed, I jumped. Not good enough to be in the plane and see all the people going. That's very nice. That must be fun. That's nice. I like the breeze. I like the air. You want to go? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just going to watch them go. I'll just go nice and land easily in the plane. People treat Christianity that way. They have faith in statements, but they don't have faith in their actions. That you're a believer means you talk to your neighbor, means you help your neighbor, and you say, Jesus loves you, he sent me into your life, and you into my life. I believe that. Many, many quiet Christians that will find out in the end they were never really Christians. It's a childlike faith and simplicity and trust. Matthew 17, 20. Matthew 17, 20. He said to them, because of your little faith. They were asking, Lord, how come we could not perform this miracle? How come this didn't happen? How come, Lord, when you do it, it works out, but when we pray, it doesn't happen? And he says, because of your little faith. Now, how little must that faith have been when Jesus says, all you need is the mustard seed. Have you seen a mustard seed? Jerry will show you one. You can't see it. You can feel it rubbing amongst your fingers. It's so small. And if their faith was so little, it was small that it must have seen it was no faith. Because of your little faith, he says. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, it's interesting that he uses a real, tangible, testable example. He doesn't say if your faith was little. He gives them a word picture. Think of a mustard seed. That, you've got, that, that is your standard right there if you can reach that. If your faith was like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, why would I want to be talking to a mountain anyway? We're not into ge geology and changing the platform of the world, right? But he says, and I'll tell you what this probably means. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And with that kind of little faith, it will move. And here's the important part. Nothing will be impossible for you. Is it impossible to change my vocabulary? My cursing, my anger, my envy. Is, is it possible to change my addiction? Can I just be a Christian saved, but I'm going to just wallow in my failures and losses and sin? Jesus says, no, because this mountain is the heart. This mountain is that sin that can be moved from here to there. All it takes is faith as small as a mustard seed. We got to analyze that. What, what does that mean? We want to touch it. This faith that's so small, it's simple and it's trusting that God knows, that He loves, that He cares, and that He is invested. In your life. Simple faith in this case. Surrenders to God's perfect will. Oh Lord but I don't want to move. 
And God is showing you through people, scripture, and circumstances, it's time to move, or it's time to stay, or it's time to change the job, or it's time to do something you never thought about doing. Lord, I have no idea what you're doing, but I believe it's you doing it, so I'm going to do it. It's his perfect will and his omnipotence. It's the faith that lets go of the visible obstacles or even attractions letting go. Entrusting. Think of Gideon. Too many Midianites? Not enough soldiers. I'm the least of my family, and my family is the least of the nation. Not going to do it. And God, in His grace, He doesn't give up because He keeps going after Him, looking for that point where He's going to have the faith to inspire 300 men to do what thousands could not. Think of David and Goliath. Big, big, big guy, big sword and big lance. I've got nothing but some rocks in my slingshot. But I come to you in the name of, Yesh, of Jehovah. Not Yeshua yet. He didn't look at Goliath. He looked at God. The simplicity and trust of faith is childlike faith. Now, if you're struggling... And you're fighting both God and your flesh. Expect God to treat you like a child. And circumstances will come into your life that will shake you down and bring you down to a very foundational level of your pride. Because we don't want to be like children because of our pride. Do you know who I am? What I've accomplished? How old I am? And God says, I want you to be like a child. Look at me, not at the obstacles, not at the other opportunities. Look at me. And faith is simple when it's born out of love. So if my faith is lacking, I'm not going to go try to buy faith. I'm going to go to fall in love with Jesus once again. Love moves mountains. And lastly, in the simplicity and trust of faith, faith in the reality of life, it's the strong conviction that either gives you the strength to stand or it gives the strength to move. It doesn't make sense. We don't have the money. I don't think it's going to work. But, I, but, but God said, and whatever God does, he will do. But I'm going to do it whether I fail or not. Big struggle in my life coming up to seminary and Bible school. My mindset, stadiums. <laughs> God had other plans, and he taught me through that what it means to love and minister to one, two, three, and five. Because... The conviction of God's place and timing for the master's use and pleasure, that's all we need in life. Not the applause or the attention or admiration. It's between you and Jesus himself. Go right back to that relational connection of your faith in who Jesus is. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a definition that we know by heart. This strong conviction or trust in something to stand or to move. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The convictions of things not seen. So faith is an assurance in what we hope for, the desire, whatever that may be. When you're young, you're hoping to graduate, or you're hoping to find someone that truly loves you, and you love them, and, and you hope for that, and, and you build your life to be that, or, or you, hope for, you hope for eternity, and you know how to live building in the kingdom, not in the retirement. Think about that. The assurance of things hoped for. Because if you have that assurance of the hope, which by the way, if you're in the Word, and if you are walking with the Lord, it's the Lord that gives you that hope. 
and that hope is healthy. It's real. It's strong. It's to be realized. This assurance will give you this conviction no matter what. Abraham's faith. Well, tell me to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 11. And I'm going to see who knows their scripture as I read verse 11. He, Abraham's faith impressed God, but it did much more than that. It transformed the life of Sarah. Look at this. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even though she was past the age. Tell me what's wrong with this verse at first look. Because when I read this verse, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's not what I read in Genesis. What's wrong with this verse at the first look? Was Sarah faithful? Did she believe? She laughed. She actually started an argument with the Lord. God said, why are you laughing? Sarah goes, I wasn't laughing. Yes, you were. God comes along and he stands in the midst of Abraham and Sarah and says, listen, by this time next year, you're going to have a son. Abraham, mummy, quiet as a mannequin, not a word. Sarah, she's within hearing distance in the, in the tent, and she's laughing. She goes, look at me. Look at him. What are you talking about? And God says, why are you laughing, Sarah? Right? If you look at Genesis, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Genesis 18, 10. So Sarah laughed to herself, so she was smart enough not to speak out loud like Peter, right? <laughs> After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, how shall we have pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, is anything too hard for the Lord? Verse 14, remember that phrase and say it to yourself every time you're laughing at the impossible situation that stands in front of you. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. God is gracious in her lack of faith. Not so much with John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, right? What happened to him? Hmm? He was mum for nine months because he didn't believe what God told him he would do in the same situation. So be careful how you react when God tells you something through his word in your spirit. And then he, he, he um, authenticates it through circumstances and godly people. But it's Abraham. And the verse changes. God sees what happens in her heart. And God finally says about Sarah, the last thing we know is that Sarah by faith received power. From whom? From God, but through Abraham. His faith transformed her life. This faith is simple. Trusting Jesus, not the circumstances but it's a conviction in what God says. Well, I'll leave you in suspense. It's not how much we hear or learn, it's how much we put into practice. Simplicity and trust. The Lord will always make things plain and simple in the peace of your heart of what is right and what you must do. From that, you must trust that as you jump in your circumstance, the one that sent you will uphold you and settle you because he loves you. Faith is rooted in love. If you find that you're lacking in your faith, you're actually anemic in your love. So your prayer is, Lord Jesus, I know you love me. 
at this point, I just like you? Help me, Lord. Help me in my unbelief. Help me to fall in love with you. I mean, ultimately, when you asked her to marry you, and when you said yes to his question, outside of putting your trust in Jesus, there's no act of greater faith, is there? Because you commit yourself to spend the rest of your life with a person that you hardly know. Let's pray. Such a beautiful, sweet aroma, the fragrance of the love and grace you have for us and the joy that you give us the opportunity to walk by faith because we're looking at you and we trust you and we want you to receive the praise, the glory, and the honor for this faith that is more valuable than gold. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you continue to transform our lives that we would not just talk, admire, and observe, but that we would stand and call out your name and say, Here am I. Send me, for I believe and love you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Their faith, their faith in themselves, and that doesn't work out real well. Uh, the expression "a man all wrapped up."